Good evening and welcome to NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Wallops Island, Virginia. I'm NASA Public Affairs Officer Trent Parado. We're here to discuss the Orbital Sciences Corporation test launch of its Antares rocket, which lifted off from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, Pad A, some 90 minutes ago. We have two speakers joining us today. Well, they'll each give a brief uh, opening statement, and then we'll take questions here in the room and uh, on the phone line. So, reminder, you can find out more information about today's test launch at www.nasa.gov slash orbital. You can find all the ways to connect with NASA on social media at www.nasa.gov slash connect. Let me briefly introduce our speakers, and then we'll get started. To my left, we have Alan Lindenmoyer, manager of NASA's commercial crew, and cargo program from NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. And we have Frank Culbertson, Executive Vice President and General Manager of Orbital's Advanced Programs Group and a former astronaut. And with that, we'll open with Alan. Thank you, Trent. Well, it certainly was an amazing achievement for Orbital today, a great day for NASA, and another historic day for commercial space flight in America. Uh, the flight today was just beautiful, and it looks like the preliminary data says that all the objectives that we established for the flight today were 100% met. Uh, all the expectations we had today for today's flight was uh, beautifully met. And that cannot be done without the extraordinary teamwork between government and industry, NASA and Orbital and all our other partners with the FAA and the uh, uh, Mid-Atlantic Spaceport and the Wallops Range and everybody who worked so seamlessly together to make this happen so smoothly today. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to my team that has been working with the project since the beginning and 2008 with our uh, partnership with Orbital, uh, Bruce Manners, our project executive, and uh, Kevin Meehan uh, worked very closely with the Orbital to help help make this happen today, and I, I, they really do deserve uh, some special thanks. So congratulations, Frank, to you. Thanks, Alan. It was a beautiful flight. Thank you so much for making this happen today, and, and uh, we're looking forward to the next one, the ISS, uh, the flight to the space station coming up uh, later this summer. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Frank. My turn? Yes, sir. All right. Um, it's great to be here today, especially in, under these circumstances. Uh, on behalf of David Thompson and the entire Orbital team, I want to thank all of you for being here, and particularly for the, to the media, I want to thank you for telling our story, because it is one heck of a story. And as Alan said, that. Uh, Took a lot of people, some great teamwork, and um, and some some really tough challenges to get to this point. Um, today did go extremely smoothly, and it's a uh, it's a real testament to the team that it did. But uh, <clears throat> if you've watched our progress over the last few years, you know that this is not easy, and uh, and and making it look easy takes a lot of hard work and overcoming a lot of challenges, and and a number of people did that. To Alan and his team, Bruce and Kevin, that, that uh, worked through all of this with us, uh, thank you very much for supporting us uh, through thick and thin and helping keep things going. Uh, for today's operation, we had an amazing team that, that worked well together. We did a lot of rehearsals getting to here. You know, we th you thought we were just delaying launches, but we really just wanted to, a few more practice uh, at it. But uh, uh, the, the Mars team uh, has taken us uh, to the point where we have an amazing pad that will support what we need. Um, we had our liquid oxygen, we had our RP on board, and we had systems that uh, supported our, our launch processing. And, uh, and that's extremely important to being able to, to be successful here. And to Dale Nash and his team, thank you very much. To the Wallops team, led by Bill Robel, Jay Pittman, and, uh, and the entire team in the uh, Mission Control Center, Range Control Center, and, uh, and out at the pad, all the safety people who helped us get to here, we also uh, want to, to thank you for that uh, because they worked as many long hours as we did uh, trying to stay with us, keep up with us, and make sure that we really were complying with, with all the local regulations and helping us uh, get to a successful conclusion. Um, the, uh, the International Space Station program and the headquarters folks who supervised that, led by Bill Gerstemeyer, have been amazingly supportive. Mike Suffordini and his team, Kathy Leaders, uh, who has gone on to other things, and now Dan Hartman, have been very anxiously awaiting this uh, 
uh, test flight and the upcoming demonstration to, so that we can get going with the contract. So they've been helpful also in getting to this point. But I have to tell you, I'm really proud of the orbital team. Uh, the, uh, the men and women who worked this process and who went through the countdown training, the simulations, the wet dress rehearsal, the, uh, the practice countdowns to get to the day, if, uh, if you will, uh, just, just stayed focused, uh, s uh, stayed on task, and, and kept things moving forward in a very professional way. I was very impressed with what I saw in the Mission Control Center. No matter whether it was a minor problem or a major problem, they all pulled together. Led by people like our program manager, um, Mike Pinkston, uh, the launch director and deputy program manager, Kurt Eberle. They have kept people moving in the right direction and have dealt with a lot of very difficult things. Uh, they work for Ron Graby, the Launch Systems Group uh, General Manager, who of course has been the overall leader of this effort. And uh, without his leadership, they wouldn't be here today either. But there's one person I really want to single out, and that's Mike Dorsch, the Chief Engineer, who uh, was not only the, the Chief Engineer of the program, but the Chief Troubleshooter of everything that happened uh, pretty much through the whole program, especially real time over the last few, uh, few days. And uh, Mike has exhibited tremendous leadership, great decision-making capability, and in the end, he proved he could be a color narrator. Uh, giving us the blow-by-blow uh, blow on the launch and, and giving us the, uh, the details of where we were. And he did a great job with that. And he says that's all he wants to do in the future, I think. <laughs> uh, no, actually, he just wants to be an engineer, but, uh, but he stepped right up to the task. And he's, he's really good. There's a couple of other people that I'd like to, to point out. Uh, one is J.R. Thompson, who was uh, our president and uh, chief operating officer. Uh, until uh, last couple of years, and then he is really focused on this as his major project to get it off the ground and, and to, to do the work necessary to, to do the co coordination between NASA, orbital Mars, and, and keep things moving. Um, in addition, uh, we have a, a couple of prior program managers who've gone on to other things, but who major, made major contributions in, in getting us going. And that's uh, Dave Steffi, who's in the room today, and Brent Collins, who I know is, is uh, following all of this closely, and Brent has retired. Dave's now my chief engineer in the advanced programs group. But these folks helped uh, set the tone, get things moving in the right direction, and, and helped enable this uh, success today. A couple of other people I'd like to mention are Antonio Elias, who is here, and uh, Bob Richards, who had a, a major role in helping decide that, yeah, we really are going to build a medium-class rocket, and we're going to launch it out of Wallops. And uh, all of that has come to fruition, and that all happened like five or six years ago, I think, uh, maybe even longer in terms of, of uh, envisioning it. But it has come together, and we've proven we can do it, and we're going to do it many times coming up in the future. So my message here today is this is all about people. What we do in space is all about people on Earth. And that's the most important thing that comes out of this. Um, whether you're doing it for the government or a commercial company or jointly, it's all about the people who make it happen. And it's the expertise that America produces, the educated uh, workforce that we have, the, the leadership that we exhibit in, in maintaining a presence in low Earth orbit and beyond. It's all about the people. And so I encourage you to, to Get your kids out there studying math and science and engineering and talk to your congressmen and congresswomen about the importance of human spaceflight and spaceflight in general and keep things moving outward. We need to keep moving beyond low Earth orbit and uh, we're going to help NASA do that by taking over low Earth, low Earth orbit, providing, with the cargo, providing them with the cargo they need over the next few years so that NASA can then go on and do the other missions that are important to, uh, to project humanity beyond the, uh, the, the Earth and, and into the rest of the solar system so that our kids can, can actually have that as a part of their future. But back to this, uh, this event today, uh, the launch went off on the time we had planned. It went very well. The sequence of events went extremely well, and you'll see in the replays uh, the various events that had to happen, such as the, uh, first of all, getting that first stage all the way to Miko and helping Mike Doris get the right time um, of when it was going to occur. But then separation of the second stage, separation of the, uh, uh, the fairing, the interstage, and then the payload itself. And all of that demonstrated that when we do this again, we know how to make this happen, and we'll get that payload Cygnus 
into orbit and on its way to the International Space Station so that it can continue its mission and we can provide them the cargo, the experiments, the clothing, the food that they need to sustain and, and uh, extend their mission and so that we can keep six people up there for an indefinite period of time. And we're really looking forward to being a part of that. So I look forward to your questions. Um, we have a lot of very proud people over uh, on the base and at the uh, Launch Control Center. We're sorry about the fire out there, but you know that wasn't anticipated. And when I think they needed to clear that brush anyway, so uh, <laughs> it'll all work out in the end. Environmentalism, right? But uh, it's a it's a proud day for Orbital. Um, this is the first of many many successes to come, and uh, thank you all for being here and help us uh, send the message that uh, we're on our way to low Earth orbit. Thank you. Thanks very much, Frank. Let's go ahead and take some questions. Uh, we'll start here in the room, and let's uh, let's start here with Stephen Clark. Just get my microphone to you. Thanks, Trent. Um, a couple of questions. Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. Um, first of all, can you go over uh, what orbit you achieved uh, that you have data on? Or was it close to the target? And also, um, looking ahead toward the space station flight this summer, uh, I know the hardware is, is coming along nicely, but what about the, the software and the integration with the space station and some of the big steps coming up in the next two months to actually get the go-ahead from NASA to take that flight. Thanks. Okay. As far as today's flight, uh, we wanted a minimum of 250 kilometers. We're there approximately at 250. We will have to do some additional evaluation to see if, ex if we're exactly on target or if we need to make some adjustments. But, uh, but we think we're very close to that. And, uh, uh, you know, the sequence of events, as I said, went pretty much as planned. If we need to make adjustments for future flights, we will, we will do so. But we certainly uh, achieved orbit, and that's, that was the main goal. For Cygnus itself, the, um, the Cygnus spacecraft that will fly to the space station this summer has actually been fueled. It's ready to be transferred into the horizontal integration facility. And as soon as that rocket is ready to receive it, we'll integrate the two together. And it'll be ready to roll out to the pad sometime this summer, probably late June or early July. And uh, so we will be on track for delivery, uh, assuming the space station schedule can accommodate us and, uh, and that we don't run into any unforeseen problems. But as far as Cygnus goes, we've achieved all of our safety approvals. Uh, we've been through all the simulations necessary to uh, achieve approval for our software. We continue to look at it and to continue to do simulations, but, but so far it's gone very well with the NASA uh, participation in our sims. The ops team is ready. We do sims every couple of weeks with the NASA team to make sure we're all on the same page, and, uh, uh, and we're really anxious to get going with that. So the spacecraft will not be the long pole in getting to the pad. It really will be just at, uh, evaluating the pad condition to see what we have to do to, to refurbish it, if anything, and then getting the next core completely assemble with its engines, second stage, and get the fairing in here so we can assemble it and, uh, and attach the uh, spacecraft to the, to the front end and then roll it out. And on the NASA side, uh, there's already been a great deal of joint testing done with the software and the simulating the mission, and that's all gone very well. So what's left is to finish up the uh, verification of the final uh, safety review packages, making sure everything is compliant with uh, the visiting vehicle requirements that we establish. Once those verifications are complete, we'll go into a final review of uh, the readiness, uh, flight readiness status, and uh, we should be good to go. Let's take two more here in the room, and then we'll go to the phone line. So one, two, and then keep it moving. Gene McClellan, Talking Space, first note. Alan, Frank, congratulations. Uh, has there any information on the status of the, of the CubeSat payload that uh, Antares took up today? They did deploy, but it'll probably take a couple of orbits before they can achieve contact with them for the ones that are looking for that, because uh, they don't have very many ground stations that monitor what they're doing, but we know that they did get deploy singles. And just a, a really brief follow-up there. Did um, the, the launch delays actually help you know, the, uh, the folks in the, the Mission Control Center sort of iron out the bugs with, you know, communication among themselves and so on. Did, essentially, did those delays actually contribute to today's success? Thanks. I would say that every time you go through an operation like this, it contributes to future success. Whether you get off the pad or not, you're going to go through the same exercises, the same communication, uh, same problem solving, which is a big part of it, and keep, get the people on the same page and, and keep them sharp. So I never see a scrubbed launch attempt as a, as a problem. I see it as an opportunity to get better and better. And I can tell you from shuttle experience, sometimes it takes a lot of attempts to get off the pad, but you get better every time. One of my missions, we said, we finally trained after two months of launch failure. So. <laughs> <laughs> But 